This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about The Scarlet Empress from 1934, directed by Joseph von Sternberg. The tagline for the film, the reigning beauty of the screen. (laughs) And the synopsis here from Letterboxd, hopefully it's better than the Puppet Master 1 description. Oh God. During the 18th century, German noblewoman Sophia Frederica, who would later become Catherine the Great, travels to Moscow to marry the dim-witted Grand Duke Peter, the heir to the Russian throne. Their arranged marriage proves to be loveless, and Catherine takes many lovers, including the handsome Count Alexei, and bears a son. When the unstable Peter eventually ascends to the throne, Catherine plots to oust him from power. So, um, I actually watched this not that long ago, but two years ago. So, so several months before yeah. we actually started doing this podcast, um, it was kind of me going through these like 30s pre-code movies. And this is kind of like a highlight of it. It's part of the Criterion Collection. Um, I've not seen any other, like, even at this point, I hadn't seen any uh, of these Von Sternberg uh, movies. Uh, I've mm-hmm. seen not that many uh, Marlene Dietrich movies either. Yeah. Uh, this is their sixth collaboration. Uh, they made a total of seven movies together. And uh, as discussed just a couple of weeks ago or something like that, uh, Criterion is actually going to be putting out a box set of uh, all six of their Hollywood collaborations uh, in mm-hmm. new restorations, including this. Uh, it just doesn't include their first movie they made together, which was made still in Germany, uh, Blue Angel, which I've never actually seen before either. I think Kino's got the rights to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so... My memories of this movie uh, and looking back to my original review of it was this movie has like a, like really amazing production values. It mm-hmm. looks great. Um, but other than that, like I just like it didn't connect with me at all, really. Like I, I didn't I, I don't know anything about Catherine the Great. I remember doing the unit on like Russian history and uh, maybe junior high, which is a long yeah. time ago. Um, and it's it all like kind of 40 years those, for you, those, isn't it? Those czars and stuff like that and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all, uh, vague to me now, but, uh, yeah. so yeah, I, I went into this like, and this movie really drops you into the story. Like you're just like, Hey, the movie's going and there's a lot of intertitles that mm-hmm. are not super helpful. And they're, I kind of don't like them that much because there's a lot of them and it feels like there's, there'd be better ways to communicate this information. Um, mm-hmm. But it's kind of treated here as shorthand. And I mean, it's still 1934. This whole filmmaking technology thing is a, a work in progress. So I imagine that, uh, I mean, this is just the way that this movie delivers that information here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, this movie just kind of lays down the, the groundworks of torture and mayhem that are uh, going down here in uh, in Russia. Mm-hmm. At the time, uh, I'd say it's probably my favorite part of the movie because uh, it's just like, oh, there's just there's some breasts here. And, and it reminds you, oh, yeah, this movie is uh, pre-code before they were uh, cracking down mm-hmm. on this sort of thing. But I'm still, still pretty striking. Um, yeah, so watching this movie just like two years later from initially watching it, it all mm-hmm. actually seems pretty vague to me. Like it wasn't like a super sharp memory other than I was kind of just okay with it, kind of indifferent. Mm-hmm. And on the rewatch, I'm pretty well the same way. I mean, the the biggest thing, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, I think, the most memorable aspect of this movie is not uh, Marlene Dietrich. It is, mm-hmm. in fact, uh, the Grand Duke Peter, played by uh, uh-huh. Sam Joffe, uh, who I don't know if you remember uh, his role in uh, The Day That Earth Stood Still. Uh, he's like... What was he, Gord? He's a, scient- he's a scientist in there. He, he's okay. in there. But, um, yeah. I, does he, does he, is he over the top in that, too? No, 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 no. Nothing like this. Okay. Uh, yeah, like... That was like my big note about him. Just like he basically plays this like a German silent film villain. Uh, mm. Like he has facials <laughs> and like te- teeth and nice uh, cell phone vibration, RJ. Oh, um, sorry. And uh, he just, uh, yeah, I don't know. Every every time he's on screen, I just like, I'm, I smile too, right alongside him. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Even thinking about the movie now, I don't know. It's like 
nicely made. They're like the, the, it's got this great swirling production and stuff like that. But it feels like <laughs> the scene to scene stuff, like the stuff that you would expect to like lead you into this movie and get you to care about like ev- everybody, like all the stuff that you have seen now and you know how these movies would handle and you just might just be like, yeah, whatever. I don't really care about this, but at least I know where the story is going. Mm-hmm. None, a lot of that's not here. And I feel like this movie is mostly just concerned with like uh, visual stuff, actually, which actually makes it kind of unique and kind of interesting in its own right. And I'll, and I'll mm-hmm. get more into uh, my feelings on this movie greatly improved after I watched another movie uh, before recording today. But uh, hey, RJ, uh, Yo. What, what, what do you think of this Scarlet Empress? All right. Well, I guess just to get it out of the way. Yeah, this movie is old. Uh, yeah, it's got good production and it looks very nice. There's some pretty stellar shots of things. Um, like even just sh- like close up shots of people's faces look really well, not look well, look pretty good. Like there's some pretty nice shots where it's just like the girl's face and it's really well lit and all that. Uh, the production is super cool. You got all those wicked throne chairs that are like oh, that fucking sculpted out that of wood eagle gigantic, the eagle crazy sculpture thing man. i think uh, the one guy has an even better one where it's like kind of like a demon snake like in a hood it's like super cool so all that stuff is really good uh and now that i have that out of the way uh this movie's kind of uninteresting i think for the most part um because i think for a few reasons like I, it feels a little disjointed, like what you were saying. It kind of just goes for visual stuff, which isn't bad. Like, I like that. But I don't think this movie flows very well together. Like, it's not hard to follow. Like, I knew what was happening the whole time. Yeah. But everything just seems so, like, cut in. Like, you'll you'll have a scene, and then it'll cut to a huge text scene where it's like, and it's like, years later, yes. we're here at this place now. This is what's happening. And then it'll be a totally different scene, and you're like, okay, that's fine. But you'll have scenes like that that'll cut to, like, this, uh, like, footage of just horses running. And there's, like, so many horse montages in this where you'll have people talking, and then it'll cut to, like, a hundred people on horses just running around. And I feel like it does that stuff too much to the, to fault where I, I it's like I said, it wasn't hard to follow. I just felt like it, it didn't flow very well. Like it was disjointed, I guess. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> these things, they don't like it's like uh, things that are pieced together that don't. They didn't really have a bridge for these things. It's like, here you go. Here's this other piece. And like, I get it. It's a movie that was made in like 1932. They did a good enough job with it. It's fucking an hour and 45 minutes long. And like there, there's some pretty stellar stuff in it. Like, like I was saying, all the sets and things like that. But I thought for the most part, it was just kind of too herky jerky in like where it was going like one really good example of that is you get the intro where you're introduced to like these characters kind of and then it like cuts to like torture scenes Mm -hmm. where it's like people on like wheels and like a guy who is like the uh the ball part of a bell just getting like like dinged in the bell and Mm -hmm. i was like whoa like where did all this stuff come from right and then and then it cuts back to like the russian like escort guy and Mm -hmm. he's like here here are these furs. You'll what, need them. It's what cold. a what a hound dog he is too. Oh, that guy drops some lines like, uh, "This is a direct quote." Uh, Don't excite me with your beautiful eyes. And then a second later, he says, "I told you not to look at me." Where and then he advances on her, uh, which is, I guess, how you get a girlfriend. I don't know, um, but uh, like that's what I mean. Like you had that scene cut into that scene. And then into a different scene and you're just like, man, this thing's all over the place. Uh, but the Archduke or whatever the czar is, that guy's super cool because he's like so gross and just expressive. And he's got like bug eyes and a bowl cut. And he's always walking around with like his lips and teeth out. He's just like, <laughs> it's like, I guess, was he a real guy? That's pretty yeah, funny if he that, was. That, like, this, well, I mean, this is like based on historical fact. And there was indeed yeah. a... Uh, Grand Duke Peter uh, and, and mm-hmm. Catherine the Great did indeed marry him until then she took power 
and became this yeah. beloved folk hero with with yeah. legendarily uh, insatiable sexual appetite. Where mm-hmm. there was like a legend, uh, and this goes to the whole thing with the horses. Uh, there was a long period of time uh, where the legend is that she died at the age of sixty seven while being mounted by a horse that she brought into her bedroom. How accurate is that? It's not. Uh, she died of a of a stroke, um, but oh. the story was like, well, what caused the stroke? Like that is like legit, oh. like a thing that's like because she she just needed horse cock. Hmm. I, I wonder who started that speculation. Uh probably people <laughs> who uh, wanted to like destroy her historically. Yeah. Like I, 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 I they're, they're, Yeah, because that was like the seventeen hundreds, I guess. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Who knows? It's all it's like Rasputin. Like there's all well, sorts of gross. like crazy stuff. It's it is what it is, RJ. Yeah, you can't judge. You know, and I I hope in like 30 years when you're long dead <laughs> that uh, people uh, I'm still around to start these rumors. You know how he really died. <laughs> you know what really s- caused that stroke. But uh, no, I don't know. Like so, in terms of the Russian historical epics that we've watched, I think this one's at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, even though I didn't really like Andrew Rublev, I think it had more craft to it. And uh, what was it? Andre Tarkovsky or not? Tar- what was the other ones we watched? No, you're thinking of Alexander Nevsky was the, Alexander, that's, so, yeah. so, so that's the, that's Tark- the good that, one. That's the good one. Yeah. That's like yeah. The, the Eisenstein. Yeah. There's like the eyes. Well, that's like the those, Eisensteins. The Eisensteins. Yeah. Like, yeah. The Ivan, the terribles, like, which this like totally yeah. put me in the mind of. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like the same. I'm not it's even Russian sure. Like, historical. Yeah, Russian historical yeah, stuff. Uh, and at least like both these movies, uh, I, I, I'd say between the terrible, uh, Ivan the Terribles and uh, mm-hmm. this, like they they nail that uh, Byzantine look. Like the production oh, yeah. and scale of these movies are amazing. And I've got a, a movie I'll have to talk about uh, afterwards that I watched that like really put things into context of like how bland movies could actually be and kind of like how, why people talk about this movie in high regard, even though I, I'm totally still on the same page with you that like narratively, I think this is kind of uh, not an interesting movie, I would say, at least to me mm-hmm. and I guess to you as well. Um, yeah. Just, just like these moments that are kind of neat, but like on the whole, like even at an hour 44 minutes, I'm pretty sure that I, I checked the time on this, like the same time at the exact same moments, almost as the first second time. Cause I was like, Oh good. There's only 20 minutes left. Oh good. There's like, I remember that vividly kind of being like, Oh great. Yeah. It's, it's about to wrap up. But I was just like kind of checked out at that point, like not really yeah. engaged with this type of story. And like I said, I don't, I don't know anything of, of the story and nothing about the movie draw brought me into the caring about any of the characters. They all seem very mm-hmm. like formulaic kind of players in like historical royalty stories. Yeah. 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 I'm with you dog. Uh, yeah. So, Hey, I, I, I one of the questions I got here, I wrote out was mm-hmm. RJ, how do you feel about accents? As in like when someone plays German, should they be English British? if they are English or should they adopt a stupid German accent if you're making like a English mm. production or, or just have everyone speak in their, uh, actual get people who speak in the native languages and subtitle it, which makes your movie less marketable. It's hard to say. Um, I guess you could go like last week when we were talking about Con Air, you know how Nick Cage has that accent? Yeah. I think that's about the right level that you want. So I guess do the accent. But I, <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you could get the, people, see, that's like, so that's, that's a different thing though. Cause that's like, that, cause but... Southern people speak English. That's right. just, that's an accent. Like, that's just like accented English, but not like if you speak a completely different language, but you're like, I'm going to speak in a German accent. It's like, oh yeah. man, people shouldn't do that. It just, it sounds dumb. It's like, why not just like, I think in Valkyrie, uh, the Tom Cruise movie, it's like everyone just mm-hmm. is like English and they're all German and it's fine. And it's like, that's good. Um, you don't need to go in the other direction uh, of like comedy impersonations because now it's like it's another yeah. it's another thing the actor has to figure out and sometimes in these movies it's like inconsistent and so with this they they don't no one's trying to talk like a russian or mm-hmm. a german they're just being themselves and we get it because movies aren't real they're they can be stylized and what do you mean movies aren't real <laughs> um like like unlike infinity whatever um anyway yeah 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so yes, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we get like, so one of the things is like, so the movie opens up with young, young Catherine the Great, uh, young Sophia. She's a kid and it's just mm-hmm. like her being told stories. And then there's all these tales of torture happening in Russia. And then she's mm-hmm. growing up and now she's been married off in an arranged deal uh, to this guy that she's never met. And the guy who picks her up, she's got eyes for him and he's got eyes for her. And they just were told, oh, hey, we've fallen in love on this several week coach trip back to Russia. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh, I don't buy that, but whatever. That's how movies can sometimes work. Um, and yeah, my complaint at this point early on even is like all the expository text titles in this movie, there are mm-hmm. a lot. And it's very... Like, I mean, it's also like we're not that far removed from the silent era. So I kind of get that the thinking at this time was still like you had to like walk your audience through everything. Um, In 1932? 34. 34? Yeah. I guess. I mean, they're still oh, doing it now. Film, so Well, like this to this degree where you have giant blocks of text every five <laughs> minutes explaining things? No, I don't think so. We have, I think that's no, how the Marvel movies do it. Uh, no, because words are bad. They've learned that people actually don't read. They want things in voiceover. Oh. Uh, and that's all. I, and that, I mean, that really, I was thinking of like the Lord of the Rings movies. Like the, mm-hmm. you have like get the female voice telling the whole story and uh, you just have visuals of it. It's just ex- exposition, but not in a time consuming thing where people have to read it because it totally slows movies down because those things have to sit on the screen for a very long time as people read through things. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, here's my note of being reminded of the Eisenstein films. Uh, and yeah, I mean, both these movies, I think capture the, the look of, uh, I guess 17, like what 18th century Russia. Well, I guess to my eyes of a person that's never traveled, uh, to that continent. Well, I've been to 18th century Russia and it's pretty close. Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. It's, it's pretty close. There was more geese. Yeah. But you know, whatever, what are you going to do? Um, so at this point, uh, up until they get to the, the crazy throne room, when you first mm-hmm. see that, I was like, why did I have this note about the production? Like, and like the visuals and stuff like that. Like, I was like, what, like, where is this in the movie? And then they get there to the throne room stuff. And it's like, holy crap, look at that gigantic throne. <laughs> like mm-hmm. this stuff's nuts. And then you get all these like life-size sculpted men pulling things and closing things. And like, there's times where like, there's like, when there's no figures, like there's no humans in the frame, you're just like, oh, those are just like, you know, bookshelf sized guys. But then you see people walking amongst them. And you're like, those are massive. Like th- just the, the amount of effort and time put into these things. And there's like, they're grotesque and they're all over the place doing yeah. all, in the backgrounds. And you're like, man, that's just like so, such effortless background detail that you don't get these days. Um, but yeah, it, it really always like, I think my comment too, back with the Eisenstein stuff, especially the, uh, Ivan the terrible movies was that, mm-hmm. uh, I always found that like that kind of, Byzantine Russian look is so alien and it's also why like the Russian mm-hmm. history is so kind of odd to like watch in movies because it's like I feel like I'm always missing something and it's interesting because this movie yeah. is American at the end of the day made by Europeans um, doing a story about Russia so it's just kind of like all these degrees of removal and I think mm-hmm. maybe it, probably in 1934 people were far more familiar with the Catherine the Great story than uh, uh, you are when you're in your mid 30s living in Canada I don't know what you're talking about. Like, this is one of Canada's most beloved <laughs> historical events. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I like. I think people know the name Catherine the Great, but I always assumed it was some kind of like English queen. Am I thinking of Queen Elizabeth? Oh, yeah, you're thinking of the second. The, yeah, well, there was an Elizabeth, and then there was an Elizabeth the second. Yeah. So, anyways, I think that's what I had assumed it was. But going into this, I had no idea what it was anyways. Right. And then about 20 minutes in, I was like, oh, this is Russia. This is history. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm giving myself 20 minutes. You might think it took you that long. Yeah, it did. Because <laughs> you're Cause waiting, it, waiting for the movie to tell you this stuff. Yeah. I was waiting. Yeah, I was waiting for the uh, the text, the fourth or fifth text bubble by that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the guy with the sables giving out gloves and coats. Mm-hmm. I thought that scene was really funny where he's like, here, it's a coat. You'll yeah. need it. Here are some gloves. Yeah, you'll need these too. Here's a water bottle for you, you old lady. Uh, yeah, and so I mean, a big chunk of this movie is like about the wedding night as well. We get like the wedding, yep. 
we get the wedding reception where we get like a, mm-hmm. a fucking skeleton at the dinner table, which is mm-hmm. like, I'm like, oh, that's crazy. And I'm sure that they threw that in for some reason because it probably actually was there or something like yeah. that. Because it's like, I don't know. You don't just go, yeah, there's definitely like a, a human remains there. Uh, mm-hmm. and you have these shots passing back and forth as you build the tension of the wedding night and consummation. Ew. <laughs> a weird word for you to say ever uh and then yeah i don't know my note here is my indifference to the telling of this movie remains the same two years later um i kind of thought that maybe in a uh, world where i just spent like 10 days watching charles band movies that i'd be hungry for some some real movies some real um academically minded uh, artfully made sort of cinema i'd be like oh wowed over by it and like i've learned a lot but no i feel the exact same way so i guess i haven't grown at all as a person in two years mm-hmm. i'm just running around like an animal who are you yeah i don't think you've ever grown ever no i've uh, always been a bad dude though yeah and i think really like the one of the last few shots in this movie that uh, i even think of is like the the horses going up those steps up the, mm-hmm. like just clattering up and down those up that up those wooden steps as uh Catherine stakes out her claim after she's finally fucked over old Grand Duke pervert voyeur uh mm-hmm. Pete uh and he's leering around and banging broads and drilling holes in walls to watch women through and uh all that all that good stuff he's a, he's a, he's the the real creep of this movie Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the final shot of this movie is with her and a horse who apparently she'll oh, have sex oh. with one day. <laughs> no, do you think that, come on. A hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That was like, do you think they were doing that? For- yeah. Pre-code baby. They, they were real sly and weirdos back then. You. Yeah. This is a Jarrett pick. This movie. <laughs> yeah, this is some, up there with the Savos. Some real zoo, some real Mr. Mm-hmm. Hands action. That's real gross, dude. I don't yeah. like that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> oh, wait, and uh, RJ, this movie was a box office failure. Oh, well, what was the 1930s box office like? Uh, not great. It wasn't a big deal. Apparently, audiences had tired of these uh, von Sternberg uh, Dietrich joints. They were just kind of mm-hmm. like, they were over it. And this movie was a little too weird, a little too artsy. Um, so... The thing I discovered uh, doing a, uh, one little pass of uh, the book Cult Movies by Danny Perry that I've mentioned before on this podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was reading this and he was kind of like, he loves this movie. It seems like uh, film people who write essays, they like really like to sink their teeth into this movie and break down yeah. visuals and whatnot. He mentioned that in the same year, 1934, there was a British production called The Rise of Catherine the Great which I was like, oh, interesting. I wonder if I can find that. And it mm-hmm. turns out uh, Criterion actually put this movie out under their Eclipse collection by uh, director-producer Alexander Korda. Uh, so I watched that. It stars, uh, oh my God, uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. as uh, old Grand Duke Peter. And that movie really is generic and boring. And uh, you just like compare that movie to this. A few things pop out. So this movie was a success as far as like uh, audience reactions go. Um, Like they they were really into it. But when you watch it, you're like, this is just like every period piece movie that's set in like ballrooms and throne rooms and people just dressed up. This movie could be in any country. They just say it's Russia, but mm-hmm. the costume and dress, it just looks like it's French. Like, it looks like they just took out, like, uh, 18th century French clothing, and they had the characters wearing them, and just were standing around in, like, these, like, really great-looking sets, but they're not, like, they have no character. They're completely generic. Um, mm-hmm. And the telling of the story, it f- completely focuses on the power struggle uh, between uh, Catherine and Peter. And Peter, like, the, the the playing of Peter is, like, totally different. He's kind of just, like, paranoid that, like, she's, like, uh, she doesn't really like him. And so on their wedding night, he's just like, yeah, whatever. I'm not even going to sleep with her. I'm going to go sleep with this other broad who's, like, opening her legs up for me. Ha <laughs> ha. He just does, he goes and does that instead. Mm-hmm. Um, and she gets all hurt about it. And so she, it just turns into, like, almost like a, them trying to get 
revenge on one another by saying that they're going to sleep with all these guys. And like the whole idea is that she slept with 14 dudes like in one night, but she didn't really, but she wants him to think that. And the movie just goes on and on and on. And it is so bland and like, like not interesting on in any way. Cause it's just like, it's a movie. Um, mm-hmm. So like in contrast, like Scarlet Empress, you're like you're thinking about like all the visual stuff, like the, the, the way the scenes are built and stuff like that. You're like, yeah, no, this movie's like, has a lot of time and effort poured into it. But at the end of the day, it's like, I'm still just not that interested in this story. Yeah. Um, and like, I'd say that, I guess even the, the actual film craft in itself isn't that super interesting to me either. Cause there are other movies that I think do it, uh, in a way that I find more intriguing than this. Like right. just like this movie, I feel like, yeah, like it's kind of like I've been reading, um, God, what was it? Someone on Twitter was mentioning how they watch like a variety of movies. And I think they like, mm-hmm. they do a, they do a film podcast and they do teaching as well. And then they're critics and talking mm-hmm. about how like Citizen Kane, the appeal of Citizen Kane and why it's position is like the greatest movie of all time and has this big reputation is because it's a movie that's very teachable. Mm-hmm. Um, like you can like point to elements of like any element of film, like sound or uh, composition, mise-en-scene, acting, script writing. And like that movie captures it really well in a very clear way. Um, and mm-hmm. I think like when you want to write about movies in a particular way or like have an idea of like the types of movies, people pick up on movies such as I think Scarlet Empress and they go, hey, I'm going to talk about movies in a, this sort of way. Even though I don't think mm-hmm. it's like watchable movies that you were like, oh man, I threw Scarlet Empress in tonight. D- d- I don't think anyone's <laughs> doing that at all some, no one's binging scarlet empress so, but, but for some people for, for the audience of people who are like who like to think about films in this particular way this movie is totally up their alley and they like to break mm-hmm. they'll, they'll go back and like they will do a an analysis of it um and i guess like we we should be doing that maybe on a uh a podcast uh about criterion collection stuff but that I, that was never our mission statement uh that yeah. our, our this is the whole thing is to go through this as if it were like a a film education and I don't know. I, I feel that this movie just kind of That's yeah. not what we're about, no. man. But but I did find it super valuable uh to watch the rise of Catherine the Great and watching like, two movies coming out the exact same year about the same mm-hmm. story and just how completely different they are and just like how one is successful while not being like uh, a great film by any means, but like you compare it to another one where you're like, this is just like completely nothing like this movie is just mm-hmm. like no one no one talks about this other than it came in fact that scarlet empress exists yeah yeah i think that's pretty cool that you watched that other one as well and they i i got these totally movie. different kind of like totally different viewings out of them i guess well, and like i said like i had no idea this movie existed till i just like yeah. happened to read this uh and i was like oh shit and it hey, it's on youtube so you can't can't beat that yeah yeah exactly uh, but uh no i was just gonna say yeah, that's not what this podcast is about. If you go way back to uh, post 400 Blows when we got that super negative thing and the guy was, all he could talk about how was you couldn't pronounce the names of things and I had never seen 400 Blows before and I thought it, w- it was bad. It's like, you know what, guys? If you want a, like a film school podcast, just go to film school. You know, bro? <laughs> it's, yeah, go pay, like, pay, he, pay for your education. Don't tune into this, yeah. this, this uh, free podcast run well, by I, a couple of creeps. Dude. Well, I mean, you <laughs> usually know what you're talking about, but yeah. I feel like my role is a genuine first watch for a lot of these, which I think is a lot more relatable to people than some snooty dude. You're the, you're the Joe lunch pail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But no, I don't know. Uh, I thought this movie was fine. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, since I've got the Danny Perry book open here, let me, uh, read a, a tale that, uh, Sam Jaffe, who played, uh, the grand Duke had to share about, uh, the, the, the direct direction style of Von Sternberg. Uh, he was a strange kind of director. He imposed himself upon his actors and technicians more than anybody with any individuality could stand. He had some brilliant men design the gargoyles and stairwells, and then he'd take out a pencil and fix up their drawings. If you had to fix one of those cuckoo clocks, he was there. He was always there. In fact, he shot the whole thing. He was always down on the floor, forgetting he had a cameraman getting paid by Paramount. He was a wonderful character, all right. We didn't get along at all because he allowed me no freedom to act. He tried to absorb me. As for Marlene, when she couldn't get the dialogue the way he wanted it, he'd have her raise her shirt a little, her shirt skirt a little. That's the kind of treatment she was subjected to. 
So that was uh, some Weinsteining before Weinstein. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. yeah, that's how you get a reaction out of me usually. RJ, take off on your the shirts. podcast. It's like, what's that cell phone rumbling about? Lift your shirt, buddy. Lift your shirt up a little bit. What's going on over there? Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, this movie too, like it, it compresses like a decade of time, and it just like it's just so short, so much shorthand uh, that mm-hmm. I don't think it's like going for historical accuracy, even though like all these costumes and background stuff, like I think that is supposed to be like, Oh, they wouldn't have had that and this and this, but then the story is like, who gives a shit? So it, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, RJ, we have a business to attend to, which is who hates the Scarlet Empress? Uh, any, does anyone, some people do. Don Watson, for instance, I think. Dro Watson. Uh, half a star. Ugh, I couldn't watch more than 30 minutes. I mean, it's pretty, as all Sternberg films I've seen, but it just didn't do anything for me. I don't know what the biggest problem was, nor do I care to even contemplate it. I don't care enough. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're yelling at us for. Yeah, so mad. So angry. Dude. So people. Uh, let's hear. Let's open. Dro Watson was indeed the name. Uh, opulent film, two stars. What's the deal with all the little gnomes? What? Yep. What gnomes? I don't know. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what 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 are we doing here? Uh, it, yeah. Michael May, two stars. Couldn't finish it. It's an impressive spectacle, but is more a series of connected vignettes than a narrative. And I got really tired of Dietrich's playing wide-eyed and innocent. I could tell that she was eventually going to move away from that, but I got bored waiting. None of the characters feel genuine. They're just props in a diorama. Not um, not a crazy take or anything like that. No, but I don't know. I, I, I feel like this is the same thing every week, but it's like the problems people have about stuff... And it's very different from the problems I have on movies because usually when I have problems, they're very genuine and they're intelligent and things like that. But the problem yeah, people have... Yeah, like 400 have, Blows being a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, that movie stinks. Oh, come it's on. It's boring and it smells like farts. No. Nope. Uh, I don't know. People are always just like, meh, meh, meh. Whatever. Who cares? None of this matters. We're all going to be dead. <laughs> That's right. You know? We're all going to turn to dust. Yeah. Any... uh. Any thoughts left here on the Scarlet Empress, RJ? No. <laughs> it's fine, whatever. It's not It's not an all-time banger. I'm not going to think about this tomorrow or ever again. Or ever again. So, whatever. There you go, folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, after the break, RJ is going to get perforated by a horse. Ugh. <laughs> 